And uh, back now uh, to Philadelphia we go, and to Linda Howe. Uh, Linda Howe, an investigative journalist. Let's see if I can get this right. Uh, an investigative journalist. I, I, I think uh, for the sake of uh, brevity, we'll hold it to that. Uh, looking into crop circles, animal mutilations, that sort of thing. Right, Linda? That's right. <laughs> And happy Halloween to you and all of our new affiliates and everyone who is out there. Um, remember last week I interviewed Lassen County, California brand inspector J.D. Hemphill about the two cattle mutilations found on Susanville, California ranch October 16th. Yes. And Susanville is in northeastern California, about halfway between Alturas and Reno, Nevada, where we've had so many... Uh, UFO reports and strange sound reports and all kinds of things for the last two or three years. Well, since my report uh, last Sunday, I have received communications from two different residents who have noticed unusual black helicopter activity uh, after the mutilations and some as recently as this past Friday. One eyewitness account is from Phil Leroy, a large equipment operator who lives in Red Bluff, California, which is about 100 miles west of Susanville. Three nights after the two mutilated cows were found in Susanville, Mr. Leroy was out walking his dogs around midnight. The dogs suddenly had a peculiar reaction to something that Mr. Leroy could not see. And all of a sudden, both of them... The hair stands up on the back of their neck, and they start growling, mm -hmm. and just barking under their breath. I call it under their breath. You know, they're not barking out loud. Mm -hmm. well, I, I'm trying to figure out what the heck's going on, because I'm, I thought maybe there was some coyotes out here, because we've got a coyote pack that runs the creek areas. So I'm sitting there, and I can see something over, I don't know, 500, 600 yards from where I'm at. And I'm, it's a uh, dark night. In other words, there's no full moon or anything. It's uh, just the animate light in the area. And I could see something moving up and down a little bit over there. Meaning like a light? No, there was no light. This was just a dark spot moving up and down. A dark spot, meaning it was darker than the night sky? Right. And I go, what? You know, so by the skies are becoming more accustomed to the being outside, and I could see that it was what looked to be a helicopter. And, you know, the two, uh, uh, the three of them all told, two of them split off. One hung over here in the area that I first saw. They flew, the two of them flew off, they, they took off to, the, they split off the pod, or the, uh, the group. Of three. I got the group of three, they split off, and they came across the field between my house and another house, which is about six, seven hundred feet between them. Um, there's power lines that run down from us. They just cleared the power lines. Now, this is what is the weird part. They passed over me. They were 250 feet, less than 250 feet away, I would say or approximately, let's say approximately 250 feet away. Two helicopters, large helicopters, didn't make a sound other than I kicked up a gust of air. And my dogs went nuts. What did the dogs do? They were just growling. Um, and they, they, when the helicopters got right overhead, they spooked and ran back to the house. Have you ever seen your dogs do that to anything in the air before? No. And your, what was your own gut reaction to this? Something weird. Something ain't right here. Because I know enough about helicopters. I know that any helicopter operated in this airspace has a 500-foot ceiling limit. And how low were these? 50 feet off the deck. So they were 50 feet high and only 250 feet out from you, and you still could hear nothing but a whisper? Nothing but a whisper. There were no lights. There were no beacons. There was... 
was no marking. Not. Federal law says they have to have safety beacons. They have to have a port, starboard lights, and a safety strobe. He said nothing. He said nothing. But was the shape of this particular helicopter recognizable to you in any way? No. In fact, I've got a book right here that I've been going over. It's a aircraft identification book. Mm -hmm. And it has every known air vehicle in it. I know that they weren't Cobras. I know they weren't Apaches. I know they weren't Hovacs, which is a Russian Hovac. Uh, yeah, I've been going over these silhouettes here trying to figure out you know, if any of them were even close. Do you have not? As these uh, pass by you, did you notice uh, anything change as they went past you? And, and did you watch them until they disappeared, or what happened? I, they went past. They went over, over my head. And they went south for about 150, 200 yards. Stopped in midair, went to a hover position, a hover hover pattern, and hovered there for approximately 45 seconds. And then they both both uh, birds nose down and took off south at a high rate of speed. At the same time, I turned and looked back toward the mountains, and the other one was moving in the same direction. And where they hovered, do you know what's there? Cattle. There's only a few head down in that pasture. It's definitely cattle. Mm -hmm. Where they were hovering over here behind us, behind me, there's another cattle ranch over there. I don't know uh, if he's got any of his cattle down yet or where they're located at. But the uh, area that they were first spotted in is uh, they run cattle out there on pasture. And Art, where the two black silent helicopters hovered for 45 seconds, it was over cattle owned by the same family who found the two mutilated cows at their Susanville pasture three days before on October 16th. This man saw watched these three air vehicles on October 19th. If the helicopters are U.S. government, they might be from Fort Bragg further west of the ocean. But why would they fly 50 feet off the ground and hover over cattle? And which helicopter design can now be 50 feet above someone and only make a whisper? Well, uh, I know there have been advances in that technology. The enduring question for me is why our government, which, which could get all the cattle it needs, right. would be interested. I, I understand an extraterrestrial connection. Uh, that there could be that, or that they might go down to a farmer's land and snatch up cattle or mutilate them, but I just don't understand why our government would. That's right, and what is interesting to me as a, a journalist and an investigator of the animal mutilation phenomenon over the last uh, 15 years is when you go back into old newspaper records all the way back into the late 60s into the early 70s and on, there has been an association, eyewitness association, about dark, silent, always the term is used, silent, helicopters in the air above pastures where animals have been found mutilated, these dark, silent helicopters turn up. Uh, that, that has been such a chronic association throughout uh, these uh, almost 40 years now that the worldwide animal mutilation phenomena has been reported that one sheriff in Colorado told me when I was working on the documentary A Strange Harvest that he and others in law enforcement had come to the conclusion that they were dealing with, he called it creatures not from this planet, and that he speculated that maybe these dark, silent helicopters that in some cases dissolved into clouds even mm. uh, were some kind of camouflage being used by a non-human intelligence. Now, this man is not trying to say that. Uh, he told me he thought that 
this was uh, that these acids certainly like helicopters, but he could not find a design anywhere that matched these particular ones. Well, if you'll excuse the expression, maybe these are morphin machines. <laughs> morphin machines. Yeah, well, if they are morphin machines, uh, if there's anybody out there who knows any uh, any group or agency or uh, industry in this country or other that can make such morphing helicopters, uh, I would sure appreciate a call to my office uh, tomorrow at area code 215-491-9840, or you can write me at post office box 538 in Huntingdon Valley, Pennsylvania. That's box 538, Huntingdon, H-U-N-T-I-N-G, D is in dog, O-N, Valley, P-A, zip code 19006. Uh, my fax number is area code 215-491-9842. And I would really genuinely like to hear anonymously off the record or anyone on the record who might have any information about this strange helicopter activity uh, in California or any place else and how it might link to the animal mutilations. And for Dreamland listeners interested in uh, the books and documentary productions that I have done on these various kinds of phenomena, uh, I now have a toll-free number. 800-707-9993. Uh, that's 800-707-9993. All right. Now, very quickly, Linda, I've got something I want you to hear. Sure. All right. Uh, I believe that I've got it queued up correctly. If not, we'll find out shortly. Um, after Linda Howe's uh, chilling Bigfoot sound, which I have had great deals of fun with, um, the, during this last week, a second uh, Bigfoot scream was submitted to me, and it comes, of course, across the telephone. We're waiting for the uh, tape, uh, as Linda's did, I might add. But I thought this one also quite chilling and a good precursor to what we're doing, and I wanted to get Linda's reaction. So here it is, Bigfoot number two. <laughs> Think of that one, Linda. Where is that one supposed to be from? Well, according to the caller, many years ago he taped it from some, some sort of documentary uh, on Bigfoot. Uh, but it was, uh, I thought, good. Well, it is. Um, it's interesting in the sense that it has a uh, kind of an odd sustain quality, but it is very different than that very, very high pitch yes. sound. Oh, yes. uh, the one uh, recorded up in Snohomish. Either way, either one of them, uh, I would like to keep quite a bit of distance. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I have been getting even more uh, extraordinary uh, Bigfoot encounter reports, and there's one that uh, I will try to share on Dreamland in the next couple of weeks that I think will be quite fascinating. Excellent. Linda, we appreciate your report, as always. Thank you. You're a doll, and we'll see you again next week. Okay. Happy Halloween. Uh-huh. Take care. That is um, that is probably the nation's foremost investigator into crop circles, animal mutilations, that sort of thing. Uh, now, coming up next, Dave Esther, Sharon Gill, uh, co-writers of Twilight Visitors. It is very nearly, as you well know, Halloween. And it is the time for ghost stories. Now, as many of you who have listened through the years are aware, my attitude about ghosts is a serious one. Because I do think they exist. And I think it is one avenue of exploration with regard to whether life after death exists. It's why we look into it. In a moment, Dave Esther and Sharon Gill. If 
If you enjoy Dreamland's weekly news segments by Linda Moulton Howe, which features updates about mysterious phenomena, then you might want to know more about her books and documentaries. Linda Howe is an Emmy Award-winning television producer, writer, and researcher of Earth mysteries linked to non-human intelligences. Her books and videos provide scientific data and first-hand eyewitnesses. Linda Moulton Howe's two books, An Alien Harvest and Glimpses of Other Realities, are acclaimed for their quality, depth, photographs, and drawings. If you are interested in learning more about the mysterious animal mutilations, crop circles, UFO sightings, the human abduction syndrome, and government knowledge about these worldwide phenomena, you will enjoy these books and videos available directly from LMH Productions. You can dial 1-800-707-9993 to order. That's 1-800-707-9993. Now, Dave Esther and Sharon Gill. Apparently, one of the wire services, one of the major ones, we'll find out here in a second, picked up a story about them calling them ghost hunters, ghost riders, ghost... Well, I guess just people with a general interest in ghosts. And then ABC News Nightline, normally devoted to uh, hard news, apparently invited them on the program, and they did a sh uh, show there on ghosts. Their book is called Twilight Visitors, and let us see if we can connect with them both a feat. Let's try it. Um, uh, Dave and Sharon, are you there? Yes, we are. Okay, good. Uh, you're located someplace up in Oregon. St. Helens. St. Helens. Um, what in the world got you two started on ghosts? Uh, when we moved to Seaside, Oregon, on the Pacific Coast, we moved into a house that was haunted. And after being there for a couple of years, we decided that... Dave, I'm going to have to ask you to get good and close to the phone and speak up good and loud. All right. Uh, that'll help a lot. Very good. Okay, good. So you, you moved into a haunted house. I yeah. mean, how do you know your house is haunted? <laughs> the first night we were there, we were unloading the uh, van and moving boxes into the house. And we'd moved in uh, a short rave radio and placed it on top of a file cabinet in the den. Mm -hmm. uh, the radio wasn't plugged in and there was no batteries in it. Uh, later that evening... We get ready to retire. It was close to midnight, and all of a sudden we started hearing music coming from the den. Hmm. Uh, waltzing Matilda, huh. and it played like uh, like 12, 13 times. And we went in. It was coming from the shortwave radio, but it was still unplugged, and there's no batteries in it. Bad sign. <laughs> waltzing... That was just the beginning. Waltzing Matilda, huh? Yes. Interesting. Um. See, what I've always wondered about, Dave, now maybe you had an interest in ghosts before this, or was this the beginning of the interest? Is it, this was probably really the beginning. Uh, I grew up in a house that was haunted as a child, an old farmhouse that you could hear the, somebody walking up and down the stairs. Uh, but you really didn't think much of that. And then over the years, nothing has really happened until we moved to Seaside, and that's when... Really, the lid came off the bucket. Okay. Well, I, I take it it's going to probably worsen from here, waltzing Matilda, even out of a dead radio. <laughs> oh, no, it gets bad. <laughs> but, you know. Now, what I've always wondered about, since I've got a couple of real-life characters who have gone through this, I want to ask. In Poltergeist, in all of these other movies, um, nearly the worst has got to occur before people pack up and take off. Now, as for me, I guarantee you, uh, ghosts in my house, first sign, maybe I put it off to a bit of bad digestion or something. Second sign, I'm out of there. So you guys obviously didn't take off. Now, I know you buy a house, you've got an obligation, but still in all, uh, to have ghosts in your house seems to me would be something that would cause you to put up a for sale sign and go somewhere else. Well, not really. If, you know, if the energy that you pick up from the ghosts are positive. You don't feel threatened. Uh, and I think that's probably the key right there. We never felt threatened in our home. Well, that's important. Uh, Not at all. We, we would watch to see what was going to happen next. The noises would occur every night in the basement. We mm -hmm. would go down the next day to see what had been moved, what 
it sounded like the place was falling apart at night. In the morning, there was nothing changed. And uh, we never felt intimidated. Uh, it was more like a game to see what would happen next. And these are the kinds of stories that we've encountered over the last two years. Well, again, no offense, but in every movie I've ever seen, the basement is not the source of good things. <laughs> now, that's Hollywood version. <laughs> <laughs> and no disrespect for the stories that Brad Sanger has collected over the years, you know. But the, it appears the ghosts that we've encountered have all been happy ghosts. Uh, well, that, that's pretty much, actually, that's fairly much the case with Brad Steiger. He takes a, the lighter view of things, uh, though you wouldn't go as far as to say all apparitions, all ghosts are good. No, no definitely not. The ones that we have encountered have all been uh, of a positive nature. Uh, so, so positive are that they're like members of people's families. When we go in to investigate something, we have been asked right off if we're there to exercise because they don't want the entity disturbed. Hmm. They want it left alone. That's interesting. I, first of all, um, I don't even understand the concept of a happy ghost. Uh, the, way, the way my idea of the spirit world is structured, uh, generally when ghosts have appeared, um, it has been because of some trauma. Somebody has been murdered, somebody has died prematurely, somebody has died with everlasting uh, love, um, very strong love at a very important moment. In other words, spirit seem to be trapped on Earth not for happy reasons. So what then are you dealing with? Well, I think those the ghosts that you're talking about that are trapped here, uh, they may not be happy in that sense, but they are not uh, uh, angry ghosts. Uh, they are they are lost, confused, uh, have unresolved issues that they're uh, attempting to resolve. And in the process, they enjoy uh, pranks. Uh, Poltergeists. Poltergeists. The, the footsteps in the hallways, the cupboards that open and close, the, the dishes that move around. You put your keys down, they're gone. You know, the dull pranks that you would expect of a poltergeist. Spirits with too much time on their hands. Right. I right. Don't <laughs> <laughs> they seem to be content where they are, as are the people they're with. Hmm. Uh, that's very odd. Well, I know what you've done for your book is to collect a grand number of true ghost stories, or said to be true. And I guess the thing to do would be to uh, have you give some of the best. I know, do you, do you actually go and investigate them? Oh, yeah. Oh, you do? Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. We, uh, as the ones that are as close to us as, as possible... We do like to go and talk to the people and uh, share their experiences, and uh, we take our equipment in and uh, see what we can get. And uh, the last two uh, houses that we've investigated, we have picked up entities on film. On film? On film. Now, that begins to get my interest. Um, I have several pictures of ghosts as well. We have published them in the newsletter I just talked about a little while ago. And they are very good uh, photographs, but I have not seen one. Did you get them on regular film or video or what? I got them on regular uh, one place. It was uh, 400 ASA, and right. another place it was 200 ASA color film. Hmm. And they came out very well, very clear. Well, describe what you've got on film. Boy, I'd like to have these photos. Uh, describe what you see on film. The last one that we got are, looks like uh, a tornado, the shape of a tornado. Hmm. An energy vortex. Yeah. And funnel shape. The curving, and not only that, the funnel uh, or the energy vortex actually cast a shadow on the wall. Gee, I wonder if that's when warm spirits and cold spirits come together. <laughs> <laughs> huh. You sure can't see them with a human eye, but... Uh, it, the film picked it up very clearly. Um, the other one that we got was a mist. And the thing that was unusual about that one is that there was a mirror on the wall. And you can see the figure of a woman in the mirror. But in front of the mirror, all you can see is a mist with a pinkish tint. Well, that's really interesting. 
Uh, do you uh, do you have these photos scanned into a computer format? Yes, uh, I, I scanned them in, and I've been people who've, who've uh, requested an email. I've been sending them copies. I, I would really like a copy. Um, are you members of AOL? Uh, no, but uh, we can we can send to your. The, the the problem with sending, I think, through the internet is it ends up in some sort of weird binary format. Oh, so. When you get to the other end. So maybe after the program we can exchange phone numbers and I will send you uh, my ghost photograph as well. That would be great. And we could just do a direct transfer. That'd be fine. And, and we, can, in fact, we can get some copies made and send them to Yard. That'd be good too. That way you I, see the actual original. I can actually scan here as well. Okay. Um, all right. Good. So you've got photographs, but again, when you took them. None of this was apparent. What caused you to take the photographs? In other words, you must have felt something or known something was going on. I have to admit that the last place we went to, I definitely felt something behind me. Uh, but it's an, it's an arts and crafts store in Scappoos, Oregon. Mm -hmm. And in going up the stairs to investigate where uh, there had been a lot of noise and a lot of... Um, the owner had felt a lot of, of eerie sensations and heard creaking floorboards and various things. Mm. Going up the stairs, I had a very strong feeling something was behind me. So I began shooting pictures. I got to the top of the stairs, turned around, and just started shooting and picked up this, what looks like a tornado. And why do you have any sense of why something would be visual to a camera and not the human eye? Yes, a lot of the studies that when you when you go into some research on that uh, is apparently on uh, these entities uh, are visible in a different portion of electromagnetic uh, spectrum than what we can see, and that's why some films, which are more receptive to the higher frequencies, it will uh, well, that would make develop sense. into because mm -hmm. so many of the things that we when we're there, I take uh, the electromagnetic readings on a uh, on a uh, sensor to measure the Gauss, and you know, I get your normal background rate, and it'll be a point one, point three. Now, is this a magnetometer? Uh huh. It's, um, very, it's very similar to one. Yeah, that's very impressive uh, that you would get those readings. You remember the old Ghostbusters movie? Uh huh. They were able to. Um, trap entities <laughs> um, now if you're able to measure a magnetic anomaly you're, you're proving obviously something is really going on something is really happening it's a good backup to the photographic evidence but it, it, might it be possible to in effect someday do you think actually trap an entity I don't think so at this point and that's because uh, these entities that I can I can find, because uh, the monitor will jump up to uh, three, four point oh, five point oh, from from a background like point one, point two, and it's there for a while, and all of a sudden it just vanishes. It's gone. Uh, they they move very quickly. Huh. And whether it's moved to a different location or whether it just simply you know uh, has dissipated out, I don't know. But when it's there, it will remain uh, like this one at the Arts and Crafts store. Probably for 25 minutes, it remained atop a shelf in a box filled with brooms. All right, what kind of control work do you do? If you take the same magnetometer and you put it in a home where there is no reported uh, problem or ghost or anything else, and you run it and graph it for a few days, do you see jumps in magnetic uh, anomaly? No. You don't? No, you get your normal background uh Spikes that you normally get, and almost always the spikes are under 1.0. And uh, so, so, so in other words, by a factor of many hundreds of percent, it takes a jump. It literally does. And the interesting thing is, Art, is that when you get to the center of the anomaly, as you go off to each edge, yes, uh, you maybe only have 12 inches, 15 inches, and it's back down to 0.1. So it's a very, very physically small area of magnetic anomaly. Sometimes yeah. size like, like a size of a basketball or a football. Ooh, that's really interesting. And and they're they're not shapes like 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 a human type shape. They're just uh they're I guess 
a better description, like a basketball or football in size. But you go all the way around them, and you move away 12, 15 inches, it drops right down to z essentially zero, the background noise. Wow. And yet, when you go right directly in center, it pops right up to, uh, you know, 400, 500 percent increase. Um, is there anything, I've heard many stories, of course, of, uh, I'll tell you what, we'll hold this for a break, uh, but what I want to ask when I come back, you two, is about the reported chills or cold, even cold to the degree that somebody can see their breath, that kind of cold that goes along with the presence of whatever it is we're talking about here. Back to um, uh, Dave Esther and Sharon Gill in Oregon, subjects um, of hauntings. <laughs> uh, all right, you two, um, what about this temperature thing? Have you measured anything or seen anything there? Absolutely. Uh, you know, if I can regress for just a minute, Art. Sure. When we go into a place to investigate, now, we're, we're, we're amateurs, okay? <laughs> uh, we learn all the time as we, every time we do an investigation, we learn a little bit more. We take in with us the uh, electromagnetic field meter. We take in a sound level meter for measuring your sub-audio uh, ranges and sure. then the higher end. We also take in a, temp a uh, thermometer that will measure some of a digital readout sure. because you do get a temperature drop or an increase in temperature whenever a an entity uh, is present. Typically what? Or is there a typical? Uh, there isn't really a typical. Uh, I recall one story uh, when we were down at the Liberty Theater in Astoria uh, that has three ghosts that haunt them. And uh, upstairs balcony in one of the chairs with wooden arms, whenever someone sits in it, those arms get extremely hot. Mm. And so there the temperature increases. And yet down in the basement, uh, when you're down there, and we'd go down there to change some infrared film, uh, it was it got extremely cold. The point where you felt like you, the chills were coming on. Well, um, let's try this approach. It, when you're getting a high mag magnetometer reading, the entity is literally over or next to the machine, I would say, correct? That's correct. Um, at that same point, are you measuring the temperature? And if so, how many degrees in differential have you noted? That I haven't done. We're so busy tracking the the entity, so Sherry can start taking pictures. Because whenever we get a, a high reading, then she starts snapping uh, sure. frames. And I guess it gets so exciting at that point that we just we don't get everything done at one time. Of those people that will call you up and say, "Look, something's going on in my home," or we think there is a haunting, and you go and investigate, how many times do you find something versus? you know, it being a bust? Uh, I'm not certain that we've ever really found a bust. Um, there was uh, the one evening that we went down to Sellers Arts and Crafts, uh, and it was it was real quiet. We didn't think, we didn't really pick up anything on the EMF, and uh, I didn't figure I picked up anything on film. Um, so we thought, well, we'll try again when, when the activity picks up. Sure. Um, that was the night I got the picture of the entity behind me. Hmm. So. Yeah, I walked up those same stairs with the EMF meter, found absolutely nothing. Uh, it's kind of like they, they can come and go uh, as they want. And I think the one time we, we can find them is when they want us to be found. When they want to be found. When they yeah. want to be found. It do you was. do you think they they enjoy people like uh, Dave and Sharon and ah some ghost investigators let's have some fun here. <laughs> I think I think that sometimes they like attention. They just, just, they're like 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 you and I. Uh, once in a while you like to have attention given to you. But I think also our, we take a, an approach to our investigations of uh, respect and reverence toward um, the entity also because I think if, you, if you're going in with, with the wrong attitude it makes a difference that's interesting uh, Brad Steiger did talk about attitude once uh, you may have heard him on my show I bet you did yeah, sure yeah. Yeah. You, remember the, you remember the story about uh, 
uh, the ghost with the bad attitude that lifted uh, Brad and several other people up off the floor and uh, let them drop. Uh huh. Um, that came from uh, a bad attitude on Brad's part. <laughs> he insulted the ghost. Um, all right, very good. We're going to talk about the nature of what it is we're facing here when we come back. You two rest. Uh, we've got top of the hour news, and we'll be right back. From an area near Dreamland, this is Dreamland. Department of Transportation and. Of nine. You're hearing Dreamland with Art Bell. To participate in the program, call toll-free 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-8255. First-time callers, area code 702-727-1222. Or the wildcard line at 702-727-1295. This is the CBC Radio Network. Well, it certainly is. Back to Dave, Esther, and Sharon Gill. I don't want to call them Ghostbusters because that is not, that's what it is tempting to call them, but they're not because they don't bust ghosts. They just investigate them, find that most clients don't want them gone. So we'll get back to all that in a moment, talk about what a ghost really is. There is a man named John Hanley in Beaverton, Oregon, who runs a very successful home based computer biz. So successful, in fact, that he was the subject of a cup of Esther and Sharon Gill. Are you two still there? We oh, yeah. are. Good. All right. Um, I think one of the most important areas to look at first may be um, what really is a ghost. In other words, I'm a great investigator, and I'm sure you are too, about uh, whether or not we have a life that comes after this one. It is probably one of mankind's biggest questions. And uh, if there are ghosts... And if they are the remnants of, or the soul of, a departed person, uh, then there, that is very important evidence uh, toward that, uh, you know, proving that afterlife. On the other hand, if these are fallen angels, or some other form of entity that never once was human, it is something else again. Which, in your opinion, is it? From the experience that we've had, Art, on the last two years, uh, the so-called ghosts that we work with or investigated and collected stories on have been, uh, for the most part, uh, the departed souls of, of those that have lived here. Mm. In fact, they've all been Earth. Uh, they've all born, raised, and then died here on this planet. And when they've died, they've had, for one reason or another, a reason to stay behind. Instead of going on towards the light or through the tunnel or whatever maze it is that they access into, they've stayed behind. And a lot of them that we've encountered in the stories and from our own investigations have been because of, of either they're lost or confused, uh, unresolved issues, uh, or they're watching over someone until they feel it's time to go on. Hmm. They're not, uh, you know, they're not the fallen angels you hear about. They're not uh, destructive. Uh, I guess... You work with ghosts are a lot like people. You have good ones and you have bad ones. For the most part, do you believe people are good or do you, the most part, do you believe people are bad? And I guess from that uh, standpoint, is how you can evaluate ghosts. When we go in, we don't make judgments. We're very, very upfront. We go there simply to observe and to document and to learn. Well, all right. You tend to come down, both of you, on the side that ghosts or poltergeists are generally friendly or good. But um, you say there, there, there are indeed good and bad. Now, so many ghosts seem to be manifestations of some tragedy or early or tragic death. Um, wouldn't these many times be the scarier variety, it seems to me? I would think so. Now, now sometimes it's hard to confuse. No, it's not. It's difficult not to confuse uh, maybe a ghost that's, that's tormented with maybe residual energy left behind because of sorrow or pain uh, that may be imprinted into the area, uh, which you feel in the form of depressions or anxieties. Well, how do you delineate? In other words, how do you know whether you're dealing with residual energy 
or an absolute entity? Uh, from our experience, it's, it's, but the only way you can tell is if you have poltergeist events take place. If the pranks are, are being played, or uh, you, you notice uh, av uh, unusual events taking place, where an imprint of, uh, of residual energy is just always there. It doesn't go away. And yet, if you have a poltergeist present, uh, almost always it's like a, it, they go in cycles. There will be a period of time when there's no activity whatsoever, dead as a doornail. And then a little while later, it gets very, very active. And that dies down and, and goes dormant. Oh, well, that's, what, that's what's happened at uh, the Earth and Craft Store. It has been very quiet for uh, a long period of time. And uh, now the activity is slowly picking up again. And that was why they called us last week to come in. Oh, last week? Yes. Oh, yes. And uh, it was just a couple of weeks ago that we were called to a historic house in Columbia uh, City. And uh, the people there said that the owners of the house had loved the place so much that um, they feel that, that the lady is there because she didn't want to leave. She wants to make sure that the house is cared for. Hmm. And the caretakers have seen this woman at her wood stove in the kitchen in her white apron as she did every day of her life cooking Ooh. um and yet people accept this and live with it now if i went into my kitchen and i saw a lady there cooking and i knew my wife was in bed it would bother me a lot um i mean really bother you we can sit here and esoterically talk about these things but if they actually happen to you i just don't see how people could keep it together uh they call this the columbia city because the caretaker had gone upstairs to the bedroom to change the quilt on the big feather bed. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, found two imprints on the bed, as mm -hmm. though two people had sat on the edge of the bed. Right. They didn't panic. They called us to come and see what we could find. And then said, we hope you don't think we're nuts, but and then told us what had been happening there, and they're very comfortable with it. There's no fear there whatsoever. Yeah, but we also had, had a story come to us from Ohio uh, about a lady who'd moved, her, and her husband had moved in, uh, moved to Ohio from uh, Seattle for a job transfer, and they built a new house. Uh, and while well, he was away in business uh, in February of this year, uh, they... Uh, it was freezing outside, very cold, and she was upstairs, and she heard this child crying. And so she walked to the edge of the stairs, and she seen this, this little 10- or 12-year-old girl. And she was dressed in a blue dress and a white apron and white socks and uh, uh, black patent leather shoes, but she had no coat on. And so this lady called down and asked her if she wanted to have a coat, thinking it was maybe one of the neighbor's children or something. Sure. And uh, the, the little girl just vanished. Ah. And she, this woman who, who, who contacted us said that she, you know, thought maybe she was losing it a little bit, or maybe just having a hard day. And uh, then a little while later, she was in the bedroom doing some work, and she heard this little girl crying again. So she ran back out to the banister, the stairs, and she looked down, and there was a little girl. This time she walked down the stairs, walked up to the girl, and she put her hands out to, to give her a hug. But she was crying, and her hands went right to her, and she vanished instantly. Oh. Uh, and this continued for a while. She thought she was she was going crazy. Uh, added to this, the next time the apparition came, there was an old man uh, dressed in uh, kind of like the uh, the attire of gr the grapes of, of wrath, uh, with a hammer slung to his side, an old hat he had in his hand. It was like a farm laborer of that of a depression era. And they just kind of stood looking at her. And she'd have these visions of them. I call them visions because only she could see them. Uh, once when she was going to a Christmas party, they were in the back seat. And uh, her husband couldn't see them, just her. She started going, undergoing psychiatric treatment. So she thinking maybe something was, uh, she really was losing it. Well, sure. And she called because she'd gotten a copy of the book. She'd read it. 
and there were many stories in the book that of very similar nature and she realized that she had been going crazy that these were ghosts all right let's try this uh this attack you said generally you don't do not uh, exorcise or attempt to remove these entities correct that's correct um in your description of ghosts in the first place you describe them as confused misdirected or on a mission but not necessarily pleased about being earthbound and not having gone on to the light or whatever comes next mm -hmm. um, would not an exorcism be a compassionate thing to do in other words when you exorcise a ghost don't you send it off on the right path uh... not if it doesn't want to go sure. you know uh, the the belief systems of ghosts and the belief systems of, of, of we humans are can be quite a bit different you know if someone had lived uh, let's say they were uh, a chinese and they practiced the uh, the buddhist or the hindu belief system and they died practicing some type of a christian exorcism isn't going to make any difference to them because they don't accept that huh. uh... you know they leave when they want to leave it's been our experience that a lot of times these that when they're ready to go, they're, they're ready to go, and just by talking to them, they'll leave. Well, what about the famous old movie, The Exorcist? <laughs> uh, based, by the way, I understand, on a true story from St. Louis, or the St. Louis area. And um, there, of course, uh, it became possession. Have you ever seen an entity move into, or have, it, have you investigated a case of possession? No, we have not. And most of the stories that we've related to you in just the last few minutes are the types of things that we encounter on a daily basis. More the poltergeist kind of deal. Yes. Well, it would imply a consciousness because a lot of the kind of things uh, that you've been talking about seem to be practical joke type things, and that would imply that the entity has a sense of humor. Definitely. Emotions, consciousness. And, you know, uh, they, there are times when, when if you offend them, that the pranks become more severe than if you don't. Uh, if you're respectful for them, uh, it seems that they're just, the pranks are like what you'd have from a seven or ten year old. Hmm. Just little mischief things. Nothing to, of damaging of any kind, just things that are annoying. Uh, Liberty Theater is a real good example of what David was just uh, expressing. Um, Lib Liberty it, Theater? At Liberty Theater in Astoria. Okay. Um, if you go in and talk about Paul, which uh, the manager really doesn't like to do because she knows that something will happen if you talk about Paul. Uh, ABC News Night Lane was in the theater with us. We did the filming for the show uh, before we left the theater. Um, the lady said, I know something's going to happen, I just don't know what. And sure enough, uh, the next morning they went in and the butter container had exploded to a point where it, the top had flown off, which they never found, but it hit the, uh, uh, the chrome around the edge of the counter and bent it halfway up. Oh, brother. So it, it was a, a real impact. But uh, there was butter everywhere, and that had never happened before. And yet, when NBC came out and did a story the next morning, uh, when the uh, when the manager, or, or the next afternoon when the manager opened up for the evening, the popcorn had already been popped for him. <laughs> <laughs> There's really no rhyme or reason. Yeah, see that that's an entity with a sense of humor. Yeah. Uh, yet yeah, now let's talk about this entity that they, as far as I know, his name was Paul. He was a pimp. Uh, back in the in the 30s and he had two ladies of the evenings that worked for him lily and uh mary and mary and uh he threw one of them off the balcony when she wanted to get out of the business and the other lady got her throat slit and uh, in the uh, in the main theater downstairs and yet these three still continue to haunt there paul has appeared to not only the the manager but some of the customers at time and appears as a six-foot man dressed in white, very slim, with a Panama hat, a white tuxedo, mm -hmm. and a devilish smile on his face. And as soon as you look at him, he grins, and he's gone instantly. No. 
All right, I'll tell you a story in a moment. You two stand by. My guests, Dave Esther, Sharon Gill, the subject, ghosts. Right now, the subject is hard water. It comes, uh, well, you'll see it on glasses when you try to wash them. We're talking about ghosts. And again, it is very important, and I take a very serious approach to this topic because I believe there is something to it as I believe there is something uh, to an afterlife. And this is one method, and I particularly enjoy these two because they're doing actual measurements and finding actual differences in magnetic flux fields and um, they're finding it in photography and all the rest of it. It's a hands-on kind of thing. Um, Dave and Sharon, is that the way you decided to follow this, as a hands-on kind of operation? Yes. Uh, when we got into it, uh, first, you know, the idea of writing about ghosts and, and uh, folk that's taken place, I uh, kind of got attracted into it. I started collecting the straw. We got curious. Because, like you said before, if a ghost is real, <laughs> of life after they try to eliminate as much as we could that could be explained by by for example if you're on on medication and you see something right or you're sick you know something obviously that may be induced because of of health or or medication but those stories that uh where the individuals were not on a medication they were not ill they were no sane uh started to repeat themselves over and over again so you got develop a point of a common thread started running through all the stories. And that common thread kept saying they're real. All right. Um, you mentioned uh, a pimp and a couple of prostitutes. Here in the state of Nevada, where I live, prostitution is a legal business in many counties. Uh, my county happens to be one of them, my county, Nye County. And um, there are two houses here, which I won't even bother to name, but they have been haunted for many years by a ghost named Harold. And um, why, why do you suppose, either one of you who wants to answer this, that this kind of business, uh, I, hope, I hope that isn't coming toward you, um, <laughs> that this kind of business seems to draw that kind of entity to it? What, what is it about that business? Any ideas? Uh, maybe it's not so much the business art as it is the energy that they feel there. Uh, it's been our experience that if you have a, a household with a lot of turmoil and distress right. or anger, resentment, right. you're going to draw in a ghost that feeds on that. And the repercussions that you get back are the more violent ones. If you have a family that, that's, I won't say normal, but has positive energy flow coming from it, mm -hmm. where they control their feelings, their emotions... Uh, they tend to draw in the entities that are that feel in that type of positiveness, and perhaps in those uh, establishments you have there, uh, there's some type of an energy feel that that Harold enjoys being around. He feeds upon. Hmm. Um, when we come back here after the break at the bottom of the hour, I would like to ask. In fact, I will right now. Uh, both of you individually, has there been any? time when you've been investigating something and it has scared the hell out of you. No, that's that's a, just, just give me a quick yes or no right now. Absolutely. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, <okay. Yeah. laughs> All right. No doubt about it. All right. Well, then we will come back. Good. I mean, that's really good. That's healthy. And uh, I can't imagine working in that field and not being scared. So we'll find out what it is that uh, scared them the most and take your calls when we come back. From an area near the infamous Dreamland, this is Dreamland. Continue with your calls on Dreamland with Art Bell. Call Art now, toll free at 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-TALK. 
First-time callers, area code 702-727-1222, 702-727-1222, or the wildcard line at area code 702-727-1295, 727-1295, in the 702 area code. Now again, here's Art Bell. Now once again, here I am. Good uh, evening, everybody. This is Dreamland. Dave, Esther, and Sharon Gill are my guests. They've written a book called Twilight Visitors. It is a compilation of many, many ghost stories. And they are not ghost busters, but ghost, well, buddies would be closer to it, I guess. And we'll get back to them in just one moment. Um, well, no, let's do it now, as a matter of fact. I've got several faxes in already, you two. And uh, so let me hit you with some rapid-fire questions. From Phillipsburg, Pennsylvania, somebody wants to know about altered states. You know what a, a psychomantium is, I presume. Yes. Uh, a sensory deprivation chamber. And would this kind of thing, in your opinion, lead to the likelihood of uh, being able to make contact with entities? In other words, altered states. That's a good question. Uh, you know, when you get into the state of like of a shaman would get into uh, to access uh, the higher regions of the mind, uh, I can't answer. I really don't know. That's fair. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Okay, that's fair. Um, have you ever recorded any phantom audio from a mic in an empty room? This one actually comes from my engineer up at the network. Uh, Brian, in other words, uh, have you ever put a microphone in there? We all know that sometimes voices show up on tapes. Right. I haven't, but I've had uh, reports in from people who have done that. Uh, I haven't asked for copies of the audio yet, but they have said they have captured on on that. We do take a tape recorder with us. Uh, most of the time, it's too noisy when we're there. In other words, you guys are making noise. Uh, no, normally the family that, or whoever's living there is so excited about the uh, investigation. Uh, they just jabber on and on. I see. Well, that would make sense. All right. Um, now, I asked you prior to the break, what has really, truly scared you? And you might both want to respond or individually or together. I don't know. We'll do it individually. Well, I can honestly say that the uh, most hair-raising experience I had was at the Liberty Theater in Astoria. And uh, the manager told us that she would take us on a tour under the stage. Now, this building opened for their first uh, opera in 1925, so it's quite old. And uh, it's like stepping back in time when you go through the front doors. It, they... Uh, the air is different. The atmosphere is is totally different. Like you stepped into another dimension or something. Uh, and going under the stage, uh, uh, the walls are signed by people like Al Capone. Uh, it was it was quite a, a prominent theater in its time, and there were a lot of uh, uh, famous people that that attended various shows but going under the stage it was not only dark it was eerie the air was heavy um uh, it it was a real strange feeling a place that the further down you went uh, the more you didn't feel like you wanted to be there mm -hmm. as you go further under the under the stage um there are tunnels that run uh, like a maze under the town. It's um, like a town built on a town because the town has actually burned to the ground a couple of times. But uh, it was a place that made me feel very uncomfortable and I, I told Dave that I felt like we probably need to go back upstairs because it, it didn't make me feel good at all. Okay, Dave? Uh, mine also occurred in the same uh, building. Uh, we, I had to take the camera down into the, what they call the, uh, the ice room where they keep the ice machine. Mm. And that is the domain that Paul hangs out in. And one of the previous employees had, had, uh, blocked open the door with a five gallon paint uh, can, a bucket in actuality. And while she was getting the ice, 
uh, Paul moved that five-gallon bucket and slammed the door shut on her and locked her in. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no lights in that room. It's pitch black. And so that's the room I chose to go into because I had to change uh, uh, the infrared, which, as you know, has to be done in total blackness. And so I'd walk in at probably about 15 feet to the table, and then I had the door closed and walked to the table, and I unloaded the infrared that was in there and loaded some more. And as I turned to leave, I literally felt a cold air, a, br- a breath of cold air on the back of my neck. My hair at the back of my neck literally stood up, just like it, you know I'd see in the movies or something. <laughs> and I was thinking, my gosh, this can't be happening. And I, it was everything I could do to keep from turning around because I did not want to know what was behind me. I couldn't see it, but I didn't want to. I just didn't want to know. I walked as fast as I could to the door because it just really it chilled me to the bones. And I've you know, I've been to Vietnam. I've been I've been around. <laughs> that was the first time that I was literally frightened so deeply of something that I I couldn't see. We had a, when ABC was out, or, uh, we had a cinematographer with us who was a correspondent during the Vietnam War. Mm-hmm. And, uh, this man did not want to be left alone in any part of the theater. And they walked bravely in, but when we were ready to leave, they were firm believers that something was going on in that building. Well, there are many stories, um, I too, thank you very much, was in Vietnam. And there are many stories about not just Vietnam, but uh, most wars uh, regarding hauntings. And again, of course, in wars, you tend to get people uh, killed um, uh, in great moments of stress and uh, of, of various kinds. And those sorts of deaths do lead to hauntings, don't they? Yes, they do. Well, uh, all right, exactly. When we say hauntings, now, these people, like the like story you have in the book about uh, the Vietnam vet and his fallen comrades. And when each one, after a firefight, uh, each, one, each one of them came back and made, made him promise to fulfill some obligation. And at the time, he didn't realize they were dead. Because they looked just like, you know, you and I did. And he, when he discovered they were dead, he took, took him 25 years to fulfill his commitment of his promises to them. Uh, there are are times when these entities uh, will appear in human form, just like they did in real life. And there are other times where you, you simply don't see them. They're a mist or a cloud or simply a feeling you, you get, sensation. That uh, It's very confusing, and it, it makes you wonder whether you're dealing with, uh, with sort of a remnant of a soul or remnant of something, a person or you're actually dealing with their soul which is trapped here on earth or maybe a little bit of both the whole area is fascinating and confusing and let's take a few phone calls uh... west of the rockies you're on the air with dave and sharon hello hello hi hi is somebody speaking oh i didn't know <laughs> yes. i thought you were recording no turn your radio off dear yes david turn it off for me please yes david turn it off i just think this program is absolutely fantastic thank you you're welcome. Am I speaking to... Uh, all of us. Where are you? All of us. I'm in Texas at the moment. Texas, all right. Yes. And um, I just came back from Europe. I lived there. I lived, uh, I came back about two days ago, and my uncle died. And uh, I'm a journalist, but I don't want to mention that. I don't know if it's on now or not. It's not, is it? I'm just getting screened, am I not? No, we don't screen calls here. You're on the air. Oh, am I on the air? Okay, I didn't know this. Well, well when I... I say, when I picked up the line, I said, you're on the air. That's oh, an see. important cue on I line. understand. Okay, fine. Anyway, my um, ever since I was a child, my uh, um, I had these, these uh, feelings. Um, I could see um, spirits, for example, or people, people on the other side. And uh, when I was a little girl... Um, I remember waking up and seeing these people in my room. And, uh, of course, I went to my father and told my father, when you're three and a half years old, what father pays attention to a child that's three and a half and is watching a Dallas football game? Now, so, and now, this year, after, I'm 40 now, so this year, I talked to my next-door neighbor and I asked her, because I'd heard that she told, she talked about these ghost stories and there were ghosts there. And I explained how these people looked like. And she told me, you couldn't know them because, um, 
you didn't move in at the time when this man died. So evidently I saw the man, you know, that used to live there, not in the house, but the house next door, as a child. And now it's 1995, and um, are you still there? Hello? Yes. Oh, okay, fine. It's 1995. <laughs> it's fine, uh-huh. It's 1995, and, uh, of course, I can see the other side. It's very easy, but it's very difficult sometimes, too. It's like a television set. You turn it on and off. You turn the loudness. Sometimes it's too loud. Sometimes it's too less. But my uncle died uh, three days ago. That's why I came back. And in Germany, he came to visit me. And uh, he said to me goodbye, and he talked about my aunt, and then he left. And I had another miracle story. Um, my nephew was also beaten with a baseball bat mm. here in Texas. And uh, anyway, the priest came in and said he was not going to live. I mean, the doctor said he wasn't going to live, and the priest said goodbye and so forth. And I prayed, and uh, my message from the angels were, he's going to live, he's going to talk, and he's going to walk. Where the doctor said he's not going to live. He's probably going to die in the next few days. He will never be able to talk or walk. And my message was, yes, he will. So I called my brother and told him my message because they know me. And um, anyway, after some time of saying that he's going to die, he's going to die, he's going to die. Um, two weeks ago, I talked to them again. And uh, they said that uh, he uh, woke out, he, he got out of the coma. And the first thing he said was, I visited my aunt in yes. Germany. And as I was praying for him, I could feel him and I could, ba I could basically smell him in Germany. And uh, I, told, no. I told him, well, John, you know what? You've got to go back to your body. It's not your time. Go back. And I didn't know this, but um, I found this out later. A friend of his died a week before. And these are young kids, okay? And uh, I said to this boy, I said, well, God bless you. May you go to God's hands. Well, anyway, like I said, I talked to my my um, my sister-in-law, and she told me, well, Anna, you just can't believe what happened here. And I said, what happened? Oh, gosh, is he alive? What's wrong? She said, no. He woke out of the coma, and the first thing he said was, I visited Aunt Anna, and by the way, she was fighting terribly with my with my friend. And I said, I was fighting terribly with his friend? I said, no, 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 wait a minute. I prayed for him. She said, no, but he saw that as an argument. Hmm. And in a way, it was true. It, it probably looked like an argument because I told his friend to go because he wanted him, he wanted my nephew to stay. All right, listen, we've got to run here, but thank you very much for the uh, story. And here's what it makes me want to ask you two. Um, you have taken pictures of ghosts or entities is it not possible that people like this lady, our, our brain is a fantastically complicated thing, making the best Pentium running right now look silly. We don't understand all about our brain. Is it not possible that some people like this lady are able to see what you can only occasionally catch in photographs? Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, there's there's probably many cases uh, like hers recorded where uh, a person is able to into the spiritual realm, uh, their brains, uh, their eyes are seen into a frequency range that, that most of us aren't able to. Exactly. And our, children, our children overall uh, at a young age are able to see into uh, the infrared range where we as adults have, have grown so far past that that we've lost the ability. Um, animals, cats especially, yeah. react. Um, it is true about cats. Uh, oh, you two, yes. hold on just a moment. We'll be right back to you. I have cats, and I can certainly confirm that. Cats are very sensitive uh, to areas and things that we know nothing about. Can't hear, can't feel, can't see. Um, I don't know what that says about cats, but I believe it to be true. Now, I also believe to be true, uh, essentially what that lady said, and they just affirmed, that there are people that can see things that have developed, in effect, an ability that the rest of us, through the noise of everyday living, have essentially simply forgotten about. We'll be right back. How many of you two still there? We oh, sure are. All right, good. Here we go back to it again. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dave and Sharon. Hi, good morning, Art. I'm glad I finally got through. This is uh, Bob in St. Louis. Yes, hi, Bob. And I have a story from uh, about 15 years ago. Um, my mom had died when I was just before I graduated from high school, and she died on a Saturday. 
And on Monday morning was her wake, and I usually set my alarm for 7 o'clock at that time, and about 6.59, a voice rang out of my room, and I'm a very sound sleeper, and it, it really is hard for me to get up. And it said, Bob, wake up. And it was really loud and very distinct, and there was neither a female or... Dear Art, as usual, a really good program. How did your guest get started in this field? Larry in Miami, Florida. Well, Larry, um, as usual, uh, the answer was in the first part of the program, and it was because of their very own haunted house. At any rate, we're going to try and bear down hard on your calls this hour. Dave and Jaron, are you there? We are. All right. Um, look, I w would like to give you guys an opportunity to, pro, uh, uh, to uh, promote your book a little bit. Um, if people wish to get Twilight Visitors, how, how many uh, ghost stories are in here? There are 70 ghost stories. 70. And everyone's true. And everyone's true. Um, how would they get the book? They can call 1-800-WEIRD-94. <laughs> 1-800-WEIRD-94. That's a pretty good number. <laughs> we thought so. <laughs> I, I take it that you established it in 1994. Yes. 1-800-WEIRD-94. Mm -hmm. How much is your book? 13.95. Very reasonable indeed. Um, how can you say, you say every one of these is true? They're allegedly true. The stories that have been given to us uh, are alleged to have happened to the individuals. And that... Uh, in talking to the individuals, or, uh, our feelings are that what has happened has happened to them because they get very serious. It, it, it's like the gentleman you called of, uh, about that voice. Right. It's not something you forget. Oh, no. I know. I, it, to me, it is a very serious subject, and I treat it seriously. A lot of people uh, use this for a good laugh tagline at the end of a newscast or something. Um, this is a very serious subject to me, as a matter of fact. All right, let's go back to the lines. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dave and Sharon. Hello. Hello, Art. Let me turn the radio down. Here Thank you. Go. Do that. Tell Art, us, where, where are you? Show. Yes. Where are, where are you, sir? I'm calling from Pennsylvania. All right. Uh, when I was about 13, not quite 14 years old, we had moved into a new neighborhood. And uh, after living there about two weeks, I was walking home. And I was going up a street on my way home and there was a house to my left single story house and uh, the lights porch light was on there were still curtains in the window and uh, I saw coming down the hill toward me what appeared to be a transparent lady she had sort of a yellowish green glow to her mm. I remember her in exact detail the hobble how she hobbled as she walked the type of dress she wore how she wore her hair and this woman walked around me in a circle three times, kind of hobbled. And I'm turning around, following her. And I'm in amazement. I'm thinking to myself, I wonder if this is what a ghost is supposed to be. Well, finally, the lady stops. She stares at me. She turns, hobbles up the hill, goes through the wall into the house. So the next day, I uh, stop at my friend's house. And he's not there. But did, did, wait, wait a minute. Did you say goes through the wall? Went right through the wall. Oh, okay. Now, the thing is, is that my uh, friend's aunt's house was, you know, right across the street from this place. When I told her what I saw, she was, iron she was ironing clothes at the time, and she looked at me, and she gasped, and she said, you're just trying to scare me. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, oh, that's right. She said, Maddie died two weeks before you guys moved into the neighborhood. I had described in complete detail the woman who had just died. Now, they hadn't settled the estate. And I kind of wondered for a long time why that might have happened, and I think I figured it out. Now, sometime after that, my younger brother fell in with some kids, and they got into trouble, and they broke into that house, and they stole some jewelry and stuff, and they were all caught, and it was all returned. The only thing I can think of is that maybe in wanting to protect her house, maybe she knew somehow or other that that was going to happen, or she feared it. Sure. And maybe she felt that I would tell other people what I had seen, and it would scare children away. But, of course, I never said anything to anybody. Interesting. Um, again, typical, you two? Yes, it is. Yeah. It shows very much a protective, you know. When, a, when an older lady passes on, uh, she still is very concerned about her, her possessions, her home, her things, uh, until, until they're resolved. 
In other words, uh, in the near afterlife, uh, our concerns are very much like they were here. Yeah, we have there are several stories we get where it's almost like when you die, you don't know you're dead. You know, you're still going on conducting your business as you would have normally. That would be very confusing. I'm sure because now if you watch uh, and read a lot, a lot of stories have been documented where uh, someone has died and has communicated with someone, or there's been a, a motor car accident, and one has come back and the other ones have not, and they they all say the same thing. They don't. They didn't realize they were dead. They hmm. couldn't believe it. Couldn't accept it. Maybe because of the uh, the instant nature of it. I'm sure. You know, as far as passing through the house, you know, if there are electromagnetic energy field, why not? There's so much we do not understand about energy, you know, pure energy, that there's no way that we can get a handle on so much of this. All right, let me ask either one of you about this. Would you say it is a good idea, doesn't matter, or a terrible idea to build a house on top of a graveyard? A terrible idea. I think you could probably expect about the worst. I know that out here in Oregon, a lot of places are built on uh, uh, Indian burial ground, sacred ground, and uh, we don't know exactly where these places were, but the, the people whose homes are on this hollow ground do experience some very strange phenomena. Well, even worse than that, Noah, we had a, a, uh, a nuclear plant go to here along the Columbia River. Oh, no. By a, by a major international company, and uh, it was built on sacred Indian burial grounds. Oh, they hid no. the fact. And besides the fault line, we'll talk about that, but they uh, they excavated the bones and, and artifacts and kept it hid from the public. That uh, nuclear uh, facility is no longer online. It, it was plagued from the day one that it was built with problems. Uh, substandard material, it just had nothing but problems. It only ran for a couple of years before it was finally, you know, I mean, it would be, always be offline more than it was online. And, you know, I've never really given it much thought to you, your question there. Perhaps by being built on the, on the sacred burial grounds, there's a lot of restless spirits who really resented what was being done. <laughs> I mean, you never can tell. Well, it would seem a poor idea to me, and again, I, I'm going back to Poltergeist or Poltergeist 2, I can't recall. But it was awful. I remember the... Uh, you remember that one scene in the swimming pool? Yeah. I would never have made it out of the swimming pool. My, my heart would have stopped in there. Uh, west of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dave and Sharon. Hi. Hello, this is Fritz from Phoenix. Hello, Fritz from Phoenix. Well, mine is more like a statement. It's very unfortunate that we, the Western civilization, focus on the other side only on a large scale on Halloween. That's with fun and customs. Ah, uh, but Fritz, you know I do it all the time. Well, the yes, the Adele show, but I'm talking the major part of our civilization. It is true. Yet, yet, no, ghosts, that's a good point, Fritz. But yet ghosts, spirits, and the afterlife, the way I see it, should be and will be in years to come, and I'm talking after the earth changes, that the subject will be handled like a daily weather report, very respectfully, because it's here and we have to deal with it. Maybe they'll change the name from Nightline to Night Spirit. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, he does really make a good point. I consider this to be a very, very serious topic, and I take it seriously. And uh, as Fritz points out, the rest of the nation focuses in on, you know, Halloween one time a year, perhaps. And it's then there are. a holiday setting for them. Uh, yeah. And. Um, not really uh, so much on the aspect that we cover, the real aspect of um, uh, entities or ghosts or whatever they are, but sort of the dress up and go get ca candy aspect or the let's go look at the fireworks. Uh, well, that'd be 4th July. But um, getting my holidays mixed up here. But, but the mask and the candy business and all the rest of it, instead of this aspect. Well, you know, there is a, there's a different aspect of it over in the Orient. You know where they where they honor their ancestors. Yes. And there are many of the of the Eastern folks over there, uh, Asians that you know believe their ancestors are there with them. Well, I lived uh, on the island of Okinawa, and there is an interesting custom they have, uh, which I got to participate in once, uh, where at a certain time of the year, you go to a cave or a location, 
and you reverently clean the bones of your dead ancestors. Uh -huh. um, and that makes me ask again about the link between the place of burial and the entities. In other words, try not to build on top of a, uh, a graveyard of some sort. Uh, is it generally true that entities stay close to what was their body? Well, you know, that's hard to tell because when you become a spirit, you know, you're outside of the realm of, of, of space and time we have it. You operate in a different environment. And whether they can they can be next to their bones and instantly they can be, you know, a thousand miles away. Yes. Uh, we really don't know because there are so many that do come and go as transients. Uh, and always in motion. Uh, but yet, around graveyards, there is a lot of activities. Yes. And whether these are just the new ones that have come and haven't quite gained the knowledge they need to continue on, or whether they, because the graveyard is close to where their home and families are, they stay behind. So it's hard to really know which. It really, it's almost like talking about aliens. Yeah. You know, you have the different races uh, you hear about. And, and, you know, and some are good, some are bad, some are helpful. And well, uh, Dave, I'm not even sure, and Sharon, that there is a difference between what we're calling aliens and what you're calling ghosts. In some cases, there may not be. There are on-scene entities or on-scene the Twilight visitors who come and go. Some are helpful. Uh, and some, depending upon how they're helping you, some will call a guardian angel or a guardian spirit. Well, might it not, though, depend on your perspective as an individual? Let us say you have an experience and you see an entity. Um, some people might come away from that and say, I saw an alien. I saw something not of Earth. And another person might come back and say, well, I saw a ghost, or I saw Aunt Mary, or Absolutely. my grandmother, or whatever. Absolutely. It, it is all a matter of a person's perspective. Because we have stories of uh, very pers uh, protective entities who have taken care of children, uh, and yet some people would, would label them as guardian angels. And yet you have others, like this, like this energy vortex we'll send you a picture of. Yes, sir. I mean, my goodness, how can a ghost be like a funnel cloud? I mean, that you can understand a mist like cloud or something or fog because that's been portrayed quite often. But a, 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 a spin, a swirling funnel shape. Now, in the Liberty Theater, we captured on film there uh, a reverse spin vortex where it was, the spin was, was reverse of, of how it normally would be. And, they, and it was a, and like the letter U. It went down, over, and then back up again. Where this one uh, we captured just last week uh, starts from the from the floor and goes toward the ceiling, kind of bends along the way, but there's also a shadow that's cast from it. When you have a photographic expert look at these, what do they say? Well, the 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 first or the, when they look at it, they, they, the first reaction is that it's a, a chemical problem or mm -hmm. a developing problem. Yes. Well, then we show them the negative, and you don't have uh, it's not characteristic of a chemical stain. Okay, it's right in the uh, the uh, the film itself, and you can see both the uh, uh, the vortex. You can see a shadow, where on a normal chemical stain from developing, uh, it, it's quite apparent if you look at it. All right, you two, hold on just a moment. We will be right back to you. Dave Esther, Sharon Gill are my guests. They have written Twilight Visitors, a compilation of uh, 70 true ghost stories. We'll be right back. If you feel the desire to control your own work hours, your work environment, be your own boss, choose your own work companions, then maybe you need to start your own business. Now, briefly, uh, before the bottom of the hour, back to Dave and Sharon. Okay, you two, you're back on the air again. Okay. Um, I'm glad that you are doing what you're doing. Um, very glad, because there are not enough people documenting this kind of thing. It's one of the reasons... We put out the newsletter we do. You know, you talk about them on the radio, and it's great. It's the theater of the mind, and we can, you know, tell people about these things. But once you've laid your eyes on a photograph or had an actual experience, it's a whole new realm, isn't it? It really is. And we really enjoy your newsletter, you know, because when you, when you can visually observe an image, it, it, there's no doubt 
about, about what it is you're looking at. Well, if there is, there certainly is less doubt. I mean, words are one thing, photographs, magnetometer readings, there's something else again. And it's a particular area of interest to me because I want to know myself, as you two do, I'm sure, whether this life is it, and then it's the worms crawl in and the worms crawl out, or whether it doesn't matter and your spirit goes someplace else. Uh, we both firmly believe that <clears throat> life goes on. It goes back to the law of physics. You know, no energy can be destroyed. Well... It's only transformed, and so... And, you know, we... In the 70 stories we've collected, the first, we're working on our second book, collecting stories. We've probably got about as many stories right now as we have in the first book. Wow. But they're, they're more in-depth stories. They're, uh, we're getting a lot of people contributing stories to us off the Internet, uh, uh, you know, sending a story through the email. All right. Well, we'll get your email address on the air. We're at the half-hour mark. This is Dreamland. Back now to Dave and Sharon. Are you there? We are. Um, Art, could you ask your guests whether they think it is possible that certain locations on Earth are innately paranormally energized apart from any human influences, past or present? Yes, absolutely. In other words, energy, uh, I don't know what you'd call them, um, energy points? Yeah, grid points, energy points. Now you've got your famous ones like Sedona, you know, where... Is, is reputed to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, a healing capital, uh, an energy dispersion point. Uh, there's quite a few of those places uh, that just naturally radiates the energy of a very positive force. You you do like say, staying on the positive side of this, don't you? Oh, absolutely. You can see all kinds of, of, of Freddy Krueger movies on TV. Uh, we don't do those kind of stories. We do the kind of stories that you can sit and tell around the campfire and in, enjoy getting scared. Well, um, that's interesting. Uh, I do enjoy. Have you studied at all why human beings enjoy scaring themselves so much? I, I wonder about it. <laughs> I know, but uh, I got a letter, Art. This is from a funeral director back in Pennsylvania. Oh. And he said, uh, in just in part, says, I'm just glad that someone finally took me seriously. I don't know if you have any idea what the burden of disbelief can do to a person's life. He'd seen a, actually he'd heard a ghost. And no one would believe him. And being a funeral director, you, your first impressions would be, why would that be strange? Right, well, sure. <laughs> At least I, I'd feel that way. And yet, to him, it was. It, and, and by being able to tell me a story... He actually felt better at it because someone took him seriously. Well, it's cathartic, sure. Um, I would think funeral directors would be particularly plagued or blessed, depending on how you look at it. Well, there's one area in one of the towns that uh, is located next to a funeral home, uh, a neighborhood, and we've gotten three different stories from that neighborhood uh, over three, over the different period of time. Uh, from each house, you could throw a stone to the other houses. Right. And just above a funeral home. Mm -hmm. And we often wonder whether or not the the entities and, uh, and apparitions that have come to those people have come from the funeral home or just that's a coincidence. Interesting. Um, is there any difference, this is kind of a wild question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, in, the, in the hauntings that occur in cases where bodies are buried somewhere versus cremation, I don't think so. That's just my personal opinion. Because whether you burn a body or whether it decays back to the earth, the energy, the essence made up that individual uh, is transformed from at death into whatever energy feels that, that exists. So that you cannot destroy the energy matter. You only transform it to a different form. So it's actually only the body that dies away. And not the essence of the soul or, or, the, or the spirit doesn't die. Well, if the spirit remains sometimes near the body, as in the case of a graveyard, would the spirit remain near the ashes in the case of an urn? It could very well, because uh, perhaps it, it, it's a resting place for, for memories. And perhaps that's all they are to the ghost, are memories of, 
of who they once were. That may be. Now we did hear we did hear a tale about a uh, an inn in Long Beach, Washington, where there's a lot of ghostly activity, and the owner, the previous owner's urn with his ashes, still sits on the bar. Mm-hmm. Uh, that one we have yet to follow up on. All right. Well, I'm sure. What do you do, by the way, on that score? I mean. People read your books, and then I take it they contact you, and they want you to come and investigate. What what kind of criterion do you use in trying to decide? You know, we're going to take a trip to Pittsburgh and and take a look at this house or whatever. A lot of times we try to line up sightings in a, in a general area that we're that we're going to go to. Oftentimes, this story is is how compelling is it? Uh, in our book, in the last three chapters, you know, we talk about how to do your own ghost hunting type of film to use, and all type of equipment you can use, help, hopefully to help others who want to explore the unknown to start out with. Hmm. Uh, and it, you know, even if you can't buy uh, some type of, of electromagnetic meter, you can start out with a compass. Essentially the same thing will work for that. In other words, if there is a sudden magnetic flux, the compass is going to uh, be so overwhelmed from its normal north pole look see and it's going to point in a new direction. Yeah, and depending upon how much it points is how strong the field is. Mm -hmm. so and, this, and, and not bad in the sense also that it would show you the di direction of the magnetic uh, radiation. Yeah, and you, so you actually can hold in, track it down, which is the same thing I do with, with magnetic meter. You have to you know, keep moving around to, to you pick up a field and then home in on it. You do the same thing with a compass. And we talked about the type of films you can use to buy and which are some are better than others. And the cameras themselves really doesn't make any difference. We've had uh, the, the one lady who... Uh, well, let me stop you on that point. Uh, let's say somebody wants to go ghost hunting. Would they be better with the uh, higher ASA film? Or what seems to work better in catching the image? The higher the, the, higher the ASA they can go, the better. Now, right. we've tried uh, as high as 3200 ASA black and white. Right. And uh, I believe it was either the 3200 or the 1600 that we captured an image in the Liberty Theater. But Sharon also has captured it on ASA 400. Uh, we used infrared. We've captured sometimes. We captured on that. But uh, infrared is real difficult to work with, mm -hmm. and it's real difficult to get processed. All right. Let's go back to the phones. I did want to get that cleared up. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dave and Sharon. Hi. Hey, how's it going? Okay, uh, where are you, sir? I, I'm in uh, Willoughby, Ohio. This is Les. Okay. And I wanted to say um, this is really an interesting program. Thank you. I um, have actually two questions for you. Well, one question and, and, and one story. Um, I, I would really like to find a ghost. Uh, seriously. I mean, I might be crazy, but I really would like to do that. How do you go about finding someplace that's haunted? Uh, with, in our experience, we ta just started talking to people about our own experiences. And overall, I can honestly say that just about everyone we've talked to has had some type of experience. And we have made contact with people who have activity in their homes at the present time. And when we tell them what we do, they invite us to come into their home and see what we can find. Well, that's because you guys write books about it, and so you get contacts. But what about this fellow? Actually, that was how we got started on our first book, was speaking of our own experiences with other people. And I would say just go out and start asking people, you know, friends and, and neighbors and relatives that you have in the area that you're in, if they've had any type of uh, you know unusual experiences or paranormal events that have occurred in their home. And uh, a lot of times, older buildings will have it. All right, there you are, caller. In, in other words, ask friends. All right, well, the only thing that I've ever had that would be, quote, unquote, a paranormal experience is, has happened to me three times. When my um, brother died, when my two, my grandmother died, and my grandfather died. Each time when they died and I was asleep, I woke up immediately at the time that they died. Knowing I didn't something? Know that or? They were at the time until I found out, you know, usually uh, half an hour to 45 minutes later, someone would call me from sure. the hospital and say, you know, sure. so and so just died, you know, half an hour ago, 45 minutes ago. And so I, I'd really would like to pursue you know, it. 
Yeah, I, I, I've got you. Uh, and so that's good advice then for anybody. Yes, it is. I just know keep uh, when you start it, have an open mind and don't be judgmental. Don't judge what, what you observe because we may not understand uh, why why they're performing or why they're doing it. It's like when you go overseas. You can't judge the culture that you visit by your own standards. Boy, isn't that so. You know, and that's one of the first things you have to learn. And, it, and I think they can sense that. If you're not coming in a, in a judgmental attitude but an openness to understand, I think it opens the doors for you. I really do. Or, uh, and then you also stressed attitude. In other words, um, be respectful, be reverential, uh, do not insult the entity. Absolutely. The same way, the same way if you walked into, for example, the, the Alamo in, you know, in, in uh, San Antonio. Yes. You know, there's no science that's required, or, but you walk in there, and that's probably one of the most reverential places I've ever been in. You can hear a pin drop inside, and there are, you know, 40, 50 people in there. Mm -hmm. But everybody feels that reverence is there, but the respecting what had, what had occurred there. All right. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dave and Sharon on Dreamland. Hi. Hi. I'm calling from Seattle, Washington. Yes, ma'am. And Dave and Sharon, I thought I might let you know that I was in the basement of your 12th Avenue home in Seaside just today. Oh. <laughs> Is it still haunted? <laughs> and I, um, did you know that there were children that actually, it was children haunting the basement? Uh -huh. Yeah. We had children down there. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I do apologize if you get a call from the new resident because we were just going to Seaside, had stayed in only three blocks from that your house, had drove to Cannon Beach, picked up your book, and found it interesting, went back to Seaside just to look at the house, found your, the new residents outside that do not know um, that it was haunted, and we showed them the book, their jaw dropped, they said, yes, that, <laughs> that is our basement, so they took us downstairs, it's now a child's room. Oh, perfect. Good. Yeah, and, and they have not had any hmm. poltergeist activity there whatsoever. Um, but maybe if they haven't heard of it, or maybe it's calmed down, or maybe if there's a child with the children, I don't know if that would make a difference. Or maybe the entities left when uh, Dave and Sharon did. No, they did. actually, they, they, they didn't. Died. And we do have pictures in the book of uh, the people who moved in after us. Uh, they took pictures on Halloween night of their grandchildren dressed up, and they do have a film around them, a mist. We did see those pictures in the book, yes. Did you? <laughs> and there's a story in there about having a low child's voice respond back to my question of whether my daughter was down in the basement. Yes. You know, it was just as real, it was a real low girl's voice. We found this all very interesting because we picked up your book, read half of it, turned to our bell tonight, and then heard you. But we'd also like to say that we followed some of your stories, and we followed them all the way up to Astoria, where we did go to the Liberty Theater. And I do have to agree with you, and I have one question about the theater. I do, I do feel things, and um, when I went into the theater, I felt three separate entities, and I was very scared. But the theater people were very nice and let us even sit in the seat where Lily was killed. <laughs> I felt great anger in the room for us being there, and I left. Went upstairs and did feel something that I guess was Mary. I felt her about the point in the book that you said she'd be halfway up the ramp, but I had not read that yet in your book. And then when I read it, I realized that that was where you felt it, too. We went back um, to take a picture of the bathroom because we did take a picture of the theater. It was with my boyfriend. He asked that we go back. We went back, and I didn't feel her in the bathroom this time, but I did feel her behind me, and I did sort of hear voices. I'm wondering if there ever were voices heard from the uh, entities that are in the Liberty Theater. All right. Uh, there are. Oh, there are. Yeah, they've heard voices. Uh, they've, you know, they've, uh, they haven't seen, uh, I believe, it, but in fact, they've seen all three of them, and they've heard voices at different times. But it's, it, it's, it's spooky when you go in there. Definitely. You can just feel it. All right. I, I know the feeling. I have never, you know, I've seen one UFO. I have never seen a ghost. I have never seen an enti entity of any sort. But I would love to. So I'm in the category of that one man who called. And I am, I suppose, curious enough to follow up uh, if there are any haunted houses out there or anybody who regularly gets a visit from a ghost. I would love to be contacted in the night. All right, uh, I want to remind everybody as well, uh, tomorrow night on my regular syndicated program, we do something utterly different. It's called Ghost to Ghost. It, too, is a very, very serious approach to this whole matter of entities and ghosts. 
We do it every Halloween. Uh, it is not a joke show. It's not a fun show. I'm not going to be putting in a bunch of uh, little sound effects and all the rest of it. Um, we take a very serious, I take, and expect you to take a very serious approach to these matters. They are serious because I believe they are real. So if you're interested, don't forget, tomorrow night, Ghost to Ghost AM. That's about as much humor as you're probably going to find in it. Uh, it is, however, frightening. And for some reason, we human beings really enjoy scaring the hell out of each other. So it's a great opportunity for that. You guys, I want to give you a chance. Uh, the moments are closing. Twilight Visitors uh, is the name of your book. Ghost Tales, 70 of them right now. How do they get the book? One more time. Uh, they will call 1-800-WEIRD-94. <laughs> and we'd also like, uh, if any of the listeners have stories, we'd like, uh, you know, uh, if, they, if they'd like to share them with us, we'd be more than happy to consider them in our next book. Oh, and, uh, and where would they send them? Uh, they can send them uh, to Post Office Box 976, St. Helens, at H-E-L-E-N-S, Oregon. And the zip is 97051. Wonderful. Or if, they are, if they're on email, they can email me the story at uh, Star West, as one word, at a1.com. Star West at a1.com. Right. Well, uh, it has been a pleasure having you both on. And I like the approach you take to the topic. It's a good hands-on, hardware kind of approach, and we will do another show, all right? Thank yes. you very much. Thank you very much, Thank, thank you both, and uh, good night from the high desert. Well, there you are. Dave Esther, Sharon Gill, Twilight Visitors. Now, again, I want to say this because it is deadline time right now. If you want our newsletter where you will continually see this kind of thing, Documented. I'm. I'm absolutely. I'm very intent on that, so that you don't have to just believe what I'm telling you. You can see for yourself. Art Bell, After Dark, the newsletter. It's got to be ordered before the sun comes up in the morning. It's not after dark then. You see, <laughs> the deadline is now. One eight hundred nine one seven four two seven eight. That's one eight hundred nine one seven four two. 7-8 from the high desert near Dreamland. Good night.